education is preparation for reparations. And we're now going to hear from uh, Jacqueline McKenzie. Uh, Jacqueline holds m degrees in law, human rights and international relations and is a solicitor in England and Wales and a barrister in Grenada with several high profile uh, and reported cases behind her. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Esther. Strange to hear about qualifications at my age. I didn't, I didn't spot that on your list there. <laughs> no one's ever asked me about my qualifications for a very long time. Um, anyway, uh, well, thank you, and uh, all protocols observed to the rest of you. But I want to escape from the protocols for a minute just to acknowledge Professor Kwame Akufi, Akufo OBE, the Emeritus Professor of uh, International and Comparative Law at the University of West London for a very personal reason. He was my lecturer when I was an undergraduate student. He taught me a subject that is really relevant to reparations. I think it was 1986. And it's equity and trust. Never understood it then, still don't understand it now. <laughs> and he was the only black professor, and I was the only black student like her. He used to give me these looks. What's wrong with you? <laughs> I thought I'm going to understand this, I, thought I can't let the side down, so, um, so I was so delighted when I saw that you were part of this program, and I am truly indebted to you, because in my first year as an undergraduate, I actually found out I was pregnant, and I actually gave birth to one of the exams, and almost chucked it in, and it was Professor Cooper who made me keep going, and I think uh, if Suella Braverman found that out, <laughs> she'll be coming for you next. <laughs> <laughs> so I owe you loads, and uh, well, of the two or three minutes I've got left, um, I so we've been looking at the question of the law, and I agree with everything that's been said before. I, it is just really fraught and difficult, um, but there are a series of propositions as to how we may go about this. And our starting place, and, and this, you know, this isn't novel to me, lots of people have written and said this, is that ens the enslavement of Africans was a crime against humanity. And people who are writing on this use as their uh, remit for it, or their justific justification for this, the new... Sorry, I can't speak, I just need to have a sip of water. I'm sorry about that. The um, Charter, as defined in the Nuremberg tri Tribunal, which actually defined crimes against humanity as murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts, whether or not in violation of the domestic law at the time, which is what's really quite important, and that's absolutely the case that happened, uh, or the experiences of African people. But we also have other sources um, that we can look at. So the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide um, and Deliberately Inflicting uh, on a Racial or Ethnic Group Conditions Calculated to Bring About Their Destruction uh, informs us in this. And uh, even though the conventions of the UN aren't binding, they are certainly influential and important. So um, we believe that we, there is evidence in international law that enables us to show um, that the transportation and the brutalization of Africans constitute a crime against humanity within the discourse or the scholarship that exists around uh, international treaties and particularly the work done in the UN and work done since uh, the... Um, Sorry, I've just lost my thought there for a minute. Work done by the organisation, what's the name of that organisation at the UN? Very, with about 20 words in it. No, not that, there was a, a, I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. And of course, since Durban. Um, so that's our sort of starting point. But we have to look at what, when you bring a case, you look at what the defendants are, you know, you always put yourself in the shoes of the, <laughs> another lawyer in the room nodding at me, but you, but you, you, you look to see, well, how's the defendant going to defend this? And what we've heard so far is that, well, you know, slavery, certainly chattel slavery was lawful. 
And lawyers who are working with us and looking at this have said, well, where is the law? Because for something to be lawful, it needs to be stated as law, and there is no example of this anywhere. Um, they refer to the uh, concept of intemporality, which is the way of defining whether something is lawful or not at the time. And according to the principle of intemporality, a legal question has to be assessed on the basis of the laws. So there was no law, so it therefore couldn't be lawful. Um, we aren't completely out of the woods with that, because as we know, and if you were in the room earlier, when I said that the various pronouncements that we've had on this seem to exclude Africans from it and that Africans weren't deemed to be humans. Um, so it looks as though that lots of these um, doctrines and declarations were actually referring to other types of slavery, almost akin to modern slavery that we have now, and not to uh, chattelization. Um, however, the, we have the George II statute, which actually explicitly uh, prohibits the transportation of people, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the movement of Africans, that may not necessarily assist us with a more global concept as to what reparations might mean within, some, within the jurisprudence, but it certainly does take us to the descendants um, whose ancestors were transported. And we do have in this case that, uh, I mean, every article you read about this case seems to say something different. So us lawyers are always grappling to uh, understand what it means. But Somerset and Stewart, which is a case from 1772, and if you've done some reading on this, you probably just know it as a Somerset case, where we would want to rely on the judgment of uh, Lord Mansfield, um, who was sitting in the then King's Bench. Um, and he was looking at the rights of an enslaved person on English soil not to be forcibly removed from a country and sent to Jamaica for sale. And this, he decided that the statute or the state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political, but only by positive law which preserves its force long after the reasons, occasions, and time itself from whence it was created is erased from memory. It is so odious, and this is his words, that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law, which is where we get this concept of, or where we get to rely on in temporality. And he goes on to say, whatever inconveniences, therefore, may follow from the decision, and when I spoke earlier on about the floodgates, because that's what the courts are going to be concerned about. Ooh, sorry, I was only just getting going. <laughs> um, I mean, that's what the courts are going to be concerned about is the floodgates argument, the cost of this. Um, we've seen some of the work that's been done on trying to put figures um, on what reparations might look like. And I know that that's equally controversial, but, but we, we have some scholarship from the Brattle Group and others. Um, but his, his view that no matter how difficult um, this decision is, I cannot say this case is allowed or approved by the law of England, and therefore, in his words, the black must be discharged. <laughs> That's how he referred to the, um, our ancestor as the black. Um, so slavery has never been authorised by statute with England and Wales, and Lord Mansfield further found that it also was unsupported with England by the common law. We have just recently had legal discussions with uh, counsel, including Ed Fitzgerald KC, who's doing some work on this for one of the Caribbean islands, who, 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 who made this point. Um, that case was closely followed through the empire, and there were several cases um, that preceded it. But scholars are still unsure of how we use it today. But except for to say that it is absolutely clear that we didn't have law then, so the idea, I mean, unless you're, you're accepting, and it would be absurd to accept that Africans were protected by that law, then, then they are covered. And because my time has run out, I'm just going to skip the other two cases and just say, say that the British will say that the slave codes is what enable them to practice this. And Lord Mansfield actually does go on to say that the slave codes themselves 
can't or must have been unlawful. Nobody got to test it, because the only people who would have tested it tested it, would have been the people who were enslaved. And you know how difficult it is now for black people to get lawyers or to be represented fairly. Can you imagine back then somebody popping up and saying, I want to bring my case? Although there are cases, and of course the case of Somerset was somebody bringing a case. Um, but so we have all of this. We have this possible idea that the whole, the, the law that seems to, or, or that the British, contemporary British historians and politicians, because you see them from time to time, articulating the idea, my time is up, articulating the idea um, that the enslavement of, you know, of Africans was lawful, um, and we have to continue to counter it. And one of the ways we're going to have to counter it is by setting up a commission that goes right back into the legislation. I mentioned earlier on the cases that we've seen go wrong in France, and the US, but there is an enormous amount that we are unearthing, and the, there is an idea to bring a petition um, to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Uh, it is a CARICOM, unfortunately, yes, no, <laughs> petition, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, 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 and what, how that works is that what we want, or what the people bringing that petition want, is for the king, because you petition the king effectively. So King Charles will be petitioned to make a declaration and to refer the matter to the Privy Council, to the JC of the Privy Council. And he can't possibly refuse to do that because if he does refuse to do it, then he's, well, you know, can you imagine? He's effectively condoning the enslavement of Africans. But all that does, because if something is referred to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, it gives us a declaration in the same way the work that we're looking at doing with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the Committee for the Elimination of uh, Racial Discrimination, the UN Committee, and also the Inter-African uh, Court of Human Rights. All of that work will only provide us with declarations, but those, because none of those decisions are binding on any state, but those declarations will be absolutely powerful if we are to bring cases into courts. And so the work continues to explore, um, but we think there's possibilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that and um, making sure you have the time to end appropriately.